Our first speaker is Abu Bakar Abid, who is going to be speaking on Gradio improving ML uh, collaborations with interactive inference. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Abu. In our lab, we frequently run into this problem where we want to take a trained machine learning model that we've built and share it with our collaborators, who might be biologists or doctors who don't have a background in machine learning. So in our lab, we have developed this Python package called Gradio that allows you to take a machine learning model that you've trained and convert it to an interactive interface or demo, and as well as a shareable link, kind of like a Google Doc, that you can use to then send that visual interface to your collaborator or to your client or advisor or anybody. Um, the collaborator then can, can give you feedback on unusual inputs. They can put in their own inputs, crop images, and then flag the ones that are behaving unusually. So that, that really closes the feedback loop between the collaborator and the machine learning researcher. If this sounds interesting to you, visit our website, gradio.app, or our poster session outside. Thank you. Next is Adam Lavertu, who uh, has a poster titled, A Real World Drug and Disease Lexicon Derived from Reddit. Let me get this slide up. Uh, so I'm Adam. I'm a third year BMI PhD student in biomedical informatics. I'm um, in the Altman lab. Uh, Sorry. Let's Sorry. see if I can find you. Oh, here it is. Okay, yeah, uh, so my project focuses on the idea of doing uh, pharmacovigilance, uh, and one of the resources we've looked to to do this is social media data. Uh, social media data is much noisier um, and messier than the data that most NLP models are trained on, uh, so how do we go about doing work in this space? So I focus in on looking at Reddit data and Twitter data, um, and then primarily the way this is done in the past is you take an expert lexicon, so either drug bank or Medra, um, you look for those expert terms in the database and you count every hit you get. But most people don't use expert terms, most people misspell expert terms, most people use slang. Uh, so how do we go about you know, bridging that divide? Uh, so I've done work with word embedding models to then uh, produce these lexicon sets. Uh, so you get things like, you know, how do you spell heroin? Are you getting heroin, heroin, or heroin? Um, and then what are A51s, what are MP12s? Uh, these are all names for drugs. And so once we have those word models, then how do we know that you're talking about a drug and not a, um, a female hero? Uh, so my work centers around this. If you're interested in it, um, come talk to me. Thank you. Sorry. All right, next is Ajay Mandlakar, who's going to talk to us about RoboTurk, a crowdsourcing platform for robotic skills learning through imitation. Watch out for the lights. Uh, could you rewind the video? It was a little early. Hi, I'm Ajay. Uh, this is RoboTurk, a crowdsourcing platform for robotics. RoboTurk is a platform for scalable data collection through remote teleoperation. To class, uh, task demonstrations, a user just needs a smartphone and a web browser. This allows for many simultaneous users. The user receives a video stream of the robot in their web browser and uses their phone as a motion controller. The phone pose is coupled to the robot and end effector, making for easy, intuitive control. And we even tried this in the Alps, which is as remote as it gets, and we were still able to collect task demonstrations from the top of a mountain. We envision that RoboTurk will allow anyone to control robots from anywhere. And uh, if you're interested in trying out the system and controlling some robots, uh, swing by the poster session. Uh, thanks. Next, we have Apoorva Dornadula, who's going to talk about intelligible scene graph generation. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Apoorva. I'm Austin. And we're working on creating the first intelligible scene graph generation model. Uh, for those of you who don't know, scene graphs are used um, to do image captioning, image retrieval, and they're basically structures that we use to understand images where the nodes are objects and the edges are predicates. And we're, we learn each predicate um, by uh, 
we learn each predicate individually rather than distinguishing them among a set of predicates. And this allows us to do many things. For example, we can now visualize these predicates as shown on the slide. We can also do things like condense similar predicates to improve um, model training and uh, time. And we can also detect biases in the data set. And we're also trying our luck on looking at how we can use one-shot learning um, techniques and apply that to uh, the problem of seeing graph generation. If this sounds interesting to you, definitely stop by our poster. Thanks. Next is Ashwan Paranjape, who's going to talk about incorporating structure into language models. Hi. Um, so language. Oh. Um, it's a screen. Oh, so, so language models are um, um, uh, <laughs> language models are computer programs that generate language. Uh, LSTMs and LSTM RNNs are a sequential language model, so they generate sequences from left to right. For instance, uh, if you want to generate the word circulated, it will use the hidden state of the word agreement. However, we kind of know in this particular example that when reports of an imminent agreement circulated, reports is primarily, primarily responsible for generating circulated. To see that, if you just gut out of an imminent agreement out of it, you'll have when reports circulated, and that's still grammatically fine. So what if we could tell the LSTM RNN that you should use the hidden state of the word reports for generating the word circulated? And uh, that's my idea. So if you want to know more about it, I'm at the poster session. Thank you. Next is David Davis Rempe, who's speaking about predicting the physical dynamics of unseen 3D objects. Hi, so I'll be presenting a poster on learning to predict the physical dynamics of sliding 3D objects. And specifically, we're interested in being able to generalize these trajectory predictions to objects we've never seen before. Um, and this is a very important problem uh, to allow autonomous agents to be able to physically understand their environment and the objects they're interacting with, which is something that us humans do very intuitively. Uh, so we introduce a model that's able to take in an object point cloud and some initial velocities uh, and make a prediction for the future trajectory of that object. Uh, and we show both on simulated and in real world data that we're able to accurately make these predictions with our model uh, and do so on objects in shape categories that were never seen at training time. Thank you. Next is Dion Huang, who's talking about neural task graphs generalizing to unseen tasks from a single video demonstration. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Dion from Stanford Vision and Learning Lab. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about our work on neural task graph networks. So the problem we try to solve is called uh, one-shot visual imitation learning. And that means we want to execute a new task based on a single video demonstration. So here's an example on the left. We have a simulation video showing how to stack the blocks into a certain configuration. And based on this video, uh, the robot on the right is uh, able to reproduce the task and stack the blocks into the same configuration. And main con contribution of our work is that we use the task graph and that mod modularize our model. And this uh, improves the uh, parameter sharing between the tasks and improve our data efficiency and uh, allow us to learn from just a single video. And that's it. Thank you. Our next presenter is Erdem Buyik, who's talking about batch active preference-based learning of reward functions. So I'm Erdem Buyik, and this is a joint work with Professor Dorso Sari. Uh, our, our goal in this project is to learn the preference of a user for a specific task, such as driving. And humans are usually not very good at quantifying their preferences, so we do not explicitly have access to the reward functions. Uh, we instead use uh, pairwise comparisons, which are easier to collect from humans. So we develop a batch active learning algorithm that leverage these comparisons to learn the reward function. Our motivation is that learning from these comparisons can require too many data samples. So we take an active learning approach that queries the most uh, informative comparison. However, every query generation can take too much time. So we develop batch active learning algorithms that generate a batch of queries altogether using a set of techniques such as clustering based methods or 
a successful elimination to balance between informativeness, diversity, and query generation times. Thank you. Next is Greg McInnes, who's going to talk about Hubble, a deep learning approach to predicting CYP2D6 drug metabolism. Thanks. Hi, my name is Greg McInnes. I'm a PhD student in biomedical informatics, and I work in the Altman lab. And my work is trying to predict drug response from genetic data. So everyone takes drugs. They're broken down by proteins, which are encoded by genes. And variations in those genes can affect how well people break down those drugs. And that will lead to differences in efficacy and sometimes toxicity. Uh, so my work is trying to use deep learning to make predictions from DNA sequence for how, an individual, how well an individual is going to break down drugs. And so what I've developed is a system that can take in an arbitrary sequence uh, for CYP2D6, which is a gene that metabolizes most drugs, and make a prediction about uh, the response. So come check out my poster. Next we have Ha Wang, who's talking about normalized object coordinate space for category level object pose and size estimation. So my name is He. And uh, uh, so in this work, we are interested at estimating the uh, object size and pose for novel objects in real world. Um, classic object pose estimation problem always assume the object you already see it during training. Um, in this work, we are uh, interested at category level object pose and size estimation for novel objects that in RGBD images that you never see in your training. So we proposed a novel representation called NOx, uh, normalized object coordinate space to unify the information of object category, 2D instant segmentation mask, 60 poles and 30 sides. We also provide two fully annotated data sets, a mixed reality data set and a small real data set. Extensive experiments have shown that our method can robustly estimate the object poles and the sides for novel objects in new environment and also uh, achieving state-of-art performance in standard benchmark. Next is Jane Wu, who's going to talk about deep energies for estimating three-dimensional facial pose and expression. Hi, I'm Jane, and my research is on estimating facial pose and expression by combining deep learning and classical optimization approaches, hence the term deep energies. So given a video frame from an actor's facial performance, as well as the actor's blend shape model, the goal of this work is to generate a synthetic render that matches the rigid alignment and expression of the face. So to do this, we leverage a facial landmark detection network such that the optimization function um, aligns the landmark positions found on the synthetic render with the captured image. And in addition, we also improve temporal coherence and fill in any missing frames by using an optical flow network. Uh, and more generally, our approach advocates for combining methods in deep learning, um, graphics, and physics simulation. Thank you. Next, we have Jayesh Kumar Gupta, who's going to talk about model primitive hierarchical lifelong reinforcement learning. Hello, I'm Jayesh from Stanford Intelligence Systems Lab. Uh, so I'm sure everyone is aware of reinforcement learning, solving a lot of game playing tasks. Uh, however, one of the key limitations of current approaches are that they are very task specific. They would, for example, here, say learn how to solve a particular maze, but when give, and like also learn how to walk. But then when given a new maze, they basically have to restart and learn again. However, we, if you want to know how we can use a bunch of models which are like not really good, they're particularly bad at predicting what's going to happen next. Even then, you can use them to decompose the task into these simpler tasks which help transfer well across a bunch of similar maze domains. Come check out our posters. Thank you. Uh, to uh, grasp and sync objects as tools and uh, execute the desired tasks. Given the visual input of the object, we first sample multiple grass candidates uh, from the object. And uh, depending on the task, a task-oriented grasping model computes the task success probability for each candidate and chooses uh, the grasp corresponds to the highest score. Then the manipulation policy 
outputs uh, a sequence of uh, actions given the chosen uh, grasp. To learn this synergy between grasping and manipulation, we collect a large-scale data set of simulated sweeping and hammering tasks. Diverse synthetic objects are used by the robot in the simulation to train a policy that can be generalized to the real world. Thank you, and welcome to stop by our poster. Our next speaker is Eric Yi, who's going to talk about GSPN, Generative Shape Proposed Network for 3D Instance Segmentation in Point Cloud. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Li Yi, and I work with Professor Leonidas Squibus. Uh, in this work, we introduce a novel 3D object proposal approach called GSPN for instance segmentation in 3D point cloud data. Instead of treating object proposal as a direct bounding box regression problem, we take an analysis by synthesis strategy where we uh, try to generate proposals by reconstructing objects from noisy observations in a scene. We incorporate GSPN into a novel instance segmentation framework called region-based point net, which allows flexible proposal refinement as well as segmentation generation. So GSPN has been successfully applied for various of tasks, including instance segmentation in 3D scans, instance segmentation in RGBD images, as well as part segmentation in CAD models. So the success of GSPN largely attributes to the emphasis on geometric understanding, which greatly reduces proposals with low objectness. Please come to our poster to learn more. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Bao, who's going to talk to us about high quality facial capture using anatomical muscle simulation. Hey, I'm Mike. Uh, my advisor is Ron Fedko. Um, so the work that we do is related to visual effects. So have you seen any movies recently? So most movies these days have digital faces, whether it be uh, King Kong or uh, The Hulk or any of your favorite Marvel movies these days. So one of the problems with these digital faces is the uncanny valley. And we're thinking that muscle simulation is the way to push us out of this uncanny valley. So what we're doing in this work is that uh, we've made a differentiable uh, quasi-static muscle simulation model uh, that can be used uh, as an expressive simulation basis for uh, estimating facial pose and expression from a given video. So uh, if you're interested in this, uh, please come talk to me. Um, I know you probably aren't doing visual effects, but happy to brainstorm about applications to other industry areas as well. Thanks. Next is Mina Lee, who's going to talk about autocomplete systems as communication games. Suppose you're running late for a meeting, and you want to inform the other attendees by sending a message, I'm running 10 minutes late. Ideally, it would be nice if you can just type some keywords, such as 10 minutes late, and the system can infer the rest of the sentence. But the problem is you don't have any training data. As a solution, we frame this autocomplete task as a communication game between the user and the system, and we model both of them with neural networks and jointly optimize the accuracy of the system and the efficiency of the keywords that user has to type. And there are two key properties of our work. First, it's unsupervised learning, so you don't have to collect any user data. And the second, it can actually save you time. Through a user study, we show that people save nearly 50% of time for typing compared to fully typing a sentence. So if you're interested, please come by um, our poster. Thank you. Next is Minhyuk Sung, who's going to talk about deep functional dictionaries, learning consistent semantic structures on 3D models from functions. Hi, I'm Minhyuk. Uh, 3D shape is not just data, but it can be also a domain of the other types of the information, for example, like the semantic annotation of the parts and the key points and the material properties of the surface. And the goal of this project is to learn from such information associated with 3D shapes, but the challenge is that the information is defined on across different domains. So the typical approach to solve this problem is to have a canonical space that can be mapped from the oldest 3D data, but then we need to have the correspondence information. And here we introduce how we can use a neural network as a collaborative filter that can aggregate such information and align and complete them without having any correspondence supervision. So if if you're interested, in, please come to our poster. Thanks.
Uh, next is Rex Ying, who's going to talk about hierarchical graph representation and learning via differentiable pooling. Hi. Um, in, the, in this work, we... Hi. In this work, we're, uh, we're working on the problem of um, graph classification. So there are many uh, tasks related to graphs, molecules, social networks, uh, biological networks. And uh, in our setting, e we have a training set of many graphs, and each graph will be associated with the label, and we want to do the classification. Uh, oh, OK. Yeah. Um, yeah and, the, and the key insight is that we, we want to learn this aggregation function in a hierarchical way. Um, and um, we, uh, our solution is uh, uh, called DiffPool, which is um, diff using a differentiable pooling layer to automatically learn which nodes should be clustered together uh, to generate a high-level graph. And we pull uh, similar to uh, what we do in uh, uh, convolution neural net for images. Um, and this is a, a key visualization. We have uh, we we actually learned the uh, assignment strategy that assigns each low-level nodes to a high-level nodes, and, um, and we learn this pooling uh, together uh, uh, jointly end to end with the embedding network. And and this is the some visualization. Uh, come to our posters for more information. Uh, next is Shushman Chowdhury, who's going to talk about dynamic real-time multimodal routing and hierarchical stochastic planning. Good evening. I'm Shushman with Michael Cook and the Curfers Group Sizzle. Sorry, that's a mouthful. Uh, we're interested in the planning and real-time execution of routes for an autonomous agent. The agent has multiple modes of transit in a dynamic transportation network. For instance, a drone hitchhiking on cars en route, in addition to flying, en route to its destination. Such coordination can be crucial for cost and energy efficiency in a variety of applications, like urban delivery, search and rescue, and terrain exploration. This problem is challenging due to the combinatorics of multimodal planning, the online nature of the network, and motion uncertainty. However, it also has significant decomposability and underlying structure. We exploit this in a hierarchical planning framework where open loop graph search interacts with closed loop stochastic control. Uh, come to my poster for more. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Shmal Buk, who's talking about finding it, weekly supervised reference aware visual grounding in instructional, instructional videos. And I'll start there. Is this the... Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Shamal. I'm a student with the Stanford Vision and Learning Lab. So whenever we want to learn something new, like how to make a Caesar salad, we watch an instructional video on YouTube. But critically, when the instructor says, now take the green mixture, we know which box they're referring to excuse me, in the scene. And this is called visual grounding. Now, the challenge in videos is that uh, we often use pronouns like it or completely omit the, the object and leave them entirely implicit. And this is really ambiguous. Only by uh, including the, the correct referring uh, context are we able to correctly resolve the visual grounding problem. And so in our work, uh, finding it, we uh, propose a way to jointly uh, tackle both the reference resolution and visual grounding tasks and learn how to do this without requiring any training graphs um, in terms of annotations uh, uh, during training. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about that, uh, come by our poster. Thank you. Next is Srinath Srudar, who's talking about learning to generate human object interactions. One of the key characteristics of humans that distinguishes us from other animals is our ability to interact with diverse environments and skillfully manipulates objects in these environments. Uh, recognizing, representing, and encoding these, uh, and capturing and generating these interactions digitally would help us create better robots uh, and better virtual and more dynamic and immersive virtual worlds. Um, in this joint work with uh, Her Wang and Leo Gibas, uh, we present a method that can learn to recognize, represent, and generate complex multi-step human object interactions from video collections. Uh, we can use these digitized um, interactions to uh, create smarter robots, like the, like the video that you see on the bottom right there, uh, which dynamically reacts to user intent and recognizes user intent to create uh, sm smarter robots. Uh, so please drop by our poster for more details. Thanks. Next is Wen Torn, who's going to talk about deep neural networks for predicting drug target interactions. 
Hi everyone, I'm Wen Tong from the Altman Lab. The work I'm presenting today utilizes graph CNNs to predict drug target interactions. Given a therapeutically relevant target, the first step towards drug development is often to determine if the compound can bind to its protein binding site. In this work, we propose a two-step graph CNN framework for this purpose. In the first step, shown in purple, we train an unsupervised graph autoencoder to embed protein pockets into a latent pocket space. In step two, we then train two graph CNNs to extract features from the proteins and ligand graphs, respectively. To ensure that our network can um, recognize diverse set of pocket features, we initialize our network with the pre-trained weights from step one. The model then integrates information from both sides to make the final prediction. Please stop by my poster if you're interested to learn more. Thank you. Next is Winnie Lin, who's going to be talking about three-dimensional reconstruction of botanical trees with simulatable ge geometry. Hi, I'm Winnie, and I'm advised by Ron Fetko. So we're interested in reconstructing botanical trees, in particular, this tree that you see on the slides here. Now, this is a hard problem because we don't only want the large-scale structure, but also the fine, gnarly, twig-level details. In addition, um, aside from the surface geometry, we also want the underlying branching structure because this is um, really important if you want to do simulations to see how the tree reacts with external forces in the real world. Uh, yeah, so we combine uh, traditional classical computer vision techniques, um, physical simulation, and deep learning to create an end-to-end -end pipeline that goes from drone imagery to 3D simulatable geometry. Now, the tree isn't 100% complete, and our method is highly dependent on image annotations, but we do have a really cool simulatable um, geometry representation and uh, also have a lot of data that could potentially be really useful for other 3D vision tasks. Thank you. Next is Yao Lu, who's going to talk about representation balancing MDPs for off-policy policy evaluation. Hello, every hello everyone. My name is Yao, and my research focuses on the sample efficiency and safety in reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning and many other interactive learning systems, Algorithms need to learn by interacting with the environment and collecting data from it. However, in many high-stake real-world scenarios, neither a good simulator nor an online access to the real environment is accessible. To overcome that, offline learning from past observed data is highly preferable. And to achieve offline learning, we need to firstly answer the offline evaluation problem. What if we execute a different policy by only seeing past observed data? In this work, we propose a new way to learn an MDP model by balancing the uh, counterfactual and factual representation learning. Thanks. Um, next, we have Jen Ning Gung, who's going to talk about data driven cloth for e commerce. Hi, I'm Lin. So one of the big, one of the challenges for the class retailers that are trying to provide e-commerce services to their customers is that customers sometimes establish unrealistic expectations of the garment's look on their body, which introduce, uh, like the picture shown on the, on the slides, uh, which introduce logistical costs in returns, shipping, and uh, restocking. So our lab is famous for computer graphics and uh, making special effects for movies. We are now trying to combine uh, computer graphics, computer vision, and machine learning to produce uh, e-commerce applications with fast turnaround and good scalability. So here are some um, initial results. Given some post parameters, we are able to use a uh, convolutional neural network to produce some uh, the garment uh, with uh, garment geometry with some decent amount of details. So we can talk about this in more uh, more details in a later poster session. Um, so our next uh, speaker is uh, Vivek Bagaria, who's going to talk about PRISM deconstructing blockchains to scale to physical limit limits. This one? Yeah. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. We've uh, listened to a lot of good AI talks. So for a change, let me present some blockchains. So Bitcoin, uh, as most of you might know, it's a distributed ledger, which uh, 
helps you pay each other. And uh, this system has been running over 10 years quite successfully. And uh, like any other engineer, let's try to evaluate the performance of Bitcoin. So in terms of security, it has wonderful security. It has 50% security. But its throughput is quite low and its latency is quite bad. And uh, the billion dollar question is, can we obtain a protocol which gets optimal throughput and optimal latency? So now the question is, what is optimal? Is it 10 transactions, 20 transactions? And uh, for that, we have to go to the real world because it's running on a real network. So the optimality comes from the real network. So if you have, say, a bandwidth of 20 Mbps, that upper bounds your throughput to 20,000 transactions per second, and similarly, your propagation delay. So in this work, we present an algorithm prism which deconstructs Bitcoin and scales individual components and it gets optimal throughput and latency. Thank you. Please uh, stop by the poster if you're interested. Um, I think we, do we have your slide on here yet? Um, so we have a couple of uh, late entries and so we hope that they will come up and talk about their research and entice you to come to their poster. Um, our next one is Sherry Ru Ruan who's gonna talk about Smart Primer, a narrative-based intelligent tutoring system for children. Hi everyone, I'm Sherry, a CS PhD student working with Professor Emma Bronsky and Professor James Landay from Stanford Computer Science Department and Professor Roy P. from Graduate School of Education. So our project called Smart Primer is inspired by Neil Stevens' groundbreaking novel called The Diamond Age. And then in this project, we aim to build an intelligent tutoring system for children that uses engaging narratives, an intelligent tutoring chatbot, a child's physical and virtual context. Everybody learns differently, and with human-centered AI, we hope to make learning engaging and personalized. Thank you. Next, we have Chen Yu Chang, who's going to talk about us, uh, to us about D3TW, Discriminative Differentiable Dynamic Time Warping for Weekly Supervised Action Alignment and Segmentation. Hi, my name is Chen Yi. I'm a student uh, in Stanford Vision and Learning Lab. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about our recent work in CVPR 2019, where we study the problem of weekly supervised action alignment and segmentation in untrained videos. Basically, it means that we want to train a model that can predict frame-wise action level in long-horizon uh, human-centered videos. So our model, D3TW, short for discriminative, uh, discriminative, discriminative Differentiable Dynamic Time Warping, uh, it combines the advantages of gradient-based learning approach with non-parametric dynamic programming to uh, outperform previous, uh, pre previous work by a large margin. Um, our D3TW is uh, general in that it can be applied to other tasks that, that require an end-to-end differentiability and some prior structure in output. If you are interested, pl please uh, come by our poster. Thank you. Next, we have Jingwei Ji, who's going to talk about end-to-end -end joint semantic segmentation of actors and actions in video. Hi, I'm Jingwei. Uh, I'm from Stanford Vision and Learning Lab. Uh, in this work, we are solving a problem of uh, jointly uh, semantic segmentation of actors and actions in videos. So you are given a video clip where multiple events can happen. And our model does not only uh, recognize what actors are performing what actions in this video, but also localize them, localize these actions in pixels. Um, so our key insight is to formulate this problem as a joint end-to-end -end learning problem, and we achieve a new state-of-the-art performance in standardized uh, benchmark. Uh, this work appeared as an uh, oral presentation in ECCV 2018. If you are interested in video understanding and action recognition, please come by our poster. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Alan Fetterman, who's going to talk to us about Jack Rabbit, the social navigating uh, navigation robot. Last speaker, we should get some applause because afterwards we're going to. <laughs> That's a long, long 
You know, at the end of every line, there's always a guy with the bucket and the shovel, so here I am. So uh, Jack Rabot is which is trying to teach robots to be polite, and that's a complex problem, because not only does the robot have to navigate, understand where physical obstacles are, also has to understand people and how crowds of people are moving, and it also has to express its intent. So if you've ever got into the uh, hallway tango, which you go first, that's even harder for a robot. So we don't have a poster, but we have a robot, so come by and see it. Thank you.